Hello everyone, it is great to meet you. My name is Maya Stiller. I'm an associate professor at the University of Kansas where I teach Korean art history to undergraduate and graduate students. I hope that you will enjoy this virtual lecture in which I offer insights into the rich and vibrant past of Korea's Buddhist culture. But first, let me clarify what I mean by Buddhism and Buddhist art. So first of all, what is Buddhism? There are in fact many Buddhisms. The map at the bottom of the slide shows how various Buddhist doctrines and beliefs spread across Asia from the Indian subcontinent. The Buddhism practiced in Thailand is very different from the Buddhism practiced in China, Japan or Korea. So Buddhist practice can differ depending on the region. And there are also different Buddhist schools focusing on specific doctrines. By the 4th century CE, when Buddhism entered the Korean peninsula, the religion had developed into a belief system with many divinities, including many Buddhas, that is, awakened beings, such as Shakyamuni Buddha or Amitabha Buddha, and many bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas means beings who have resolved to become a Buddha. Also consider that the way how people in Europe and North America understand Buddhism today can be very different from the way how Buddhism was practiced in pre-modern East Asia. When I talk about Buddhist art, I'm referring to various visual materials used in the context of Buddhist practice. The term refers to Buddhist temple architecture as well as to paintings, sculptures, lacquerware, ceramics and textiles with a Buddhist visual narrative. The term Buddhist art is also used to refer to metal objects such as bronze bells and incense burners that were used in Buddhist rituals. I understand that in today's world it is very common to buy a Buddha statue to decorate one's home and to appreciate a Buddhist painting primarily for its aesthetic features. But in pre-modern East Asia, a Buddhist sculpture or painting was not considered art in the modern sense, but it was an icon for worship. Additionally, in pre-modern East Asia, Buddhist art not only functioned as a religious object, but also served political functions. And in today's lecture, I will discuss some examples in which Buddhist artworks had religious functions as well as political functions. This lecture's key question is, what were the biggest concerns of Buddhist believers in pre-modern Korea? To answer this question, we will look at the various measures people undertook to accumulate merit for worldly benefits and well-being in the afterlife. The first artwork we will discuss today dates from the 8th century CE, Sokkuram or Sokbursa which is an artificial cave on the summit of Mount Doham in present-day Gyeongju in the southeastern part of the Korean peninsula. Sokuram is renowned for its beautifully carved Buddha statue that is 3.5 meters or 11 feet tall, depicted in the image on the upper left of this slide. The photograph in the lower right shows the exterior of Sokuram today. Behind the temple roof that protects the entrance to the shrine, one can see the gentle mound covering the granite blocks used to build the inner chamber of this cave. A distinct feature of Sokuram is that it was made entirely from pre-cut blocks of granite, which is, as many of you may know, an extremely hard material, difficult to carve and work with. Based on strict mathematical principles that emphasized harmony and balance, the artisans created a highly sophisticated piece of architectural design and engineering. They used an interlocking stone structure to create a rectangular front chamber and a short corridor connected to a circular main chamber with a domed ceiling. To complete the iconographic program of the cave, the artists added rectangular stone slabs with carved relief figures on both sides of the entryway, the corridor, and around the central Buddha sculpture. 
This slide provides another perspective of the amazing 9 meter or 30 feet tall domed ceiling of the inner chamber. In addition to appreciating its accomplished architectural design, studying Sokuram allows us to learn what type of Buddhist divinities were worshipped in 8th century unified Chilla, Korea. The photograph in the top part of the slide gives us an overview of the inner chamber. A seated, cross-legged Buddha figure is placed centrally on a lotus pedestal, allowing Buddhist worshippers to chant sutras and conduct rituals while circumambulating in a procession around him. On the wall surrounding the main Buddha are carved relief figures at the lower section and small niches with carved images in the upper section. The photograph in the lower half of this slide shows us that these carved figures in the lower section are robed in monks' clothes. And in their hands, they are holding ritual implements such as a bell or a censer. These figures represent the historical Buddha Shakyamuni's disciples. The image at the top of this slide gives you a sense of scale of this cave. The monk who we see in this photograph is conducting a ritual while standing in front of the large main Buddha icon. In order to get to this location, he had passed the sculptural relief panels of guardian deities on both sides of the entryway, for example the two Vajra holders that visually bridge the entryway with the corridor leading into the inner chamber. These imposing deities were placed at the outer part of the shrine as a shield and protection of the site. An important term that I would like you to remember from this lecture is the term pantheon. With pantheon, I'm referring to a hierarchical structure of different types of Buddhist divinities. Where the art historians are looking at a Buddhist temple layout, an arrangement of sculptures, or the composition of a painting, they examine the most highly ranked deities, such as Buddhas, placed at the top or center, and compare them with lower ranked marginal deities placed at the bottom or periphery. Sakuram is a wonderful example for the hierarchical structure of the Buddhist pantheon. The main Buddha sculpture, seated cross-legged in the center of the structure, with his right hand in Bhumisbhasha Mudra, or earth-touching mudra, represents the highest level of sanctity. The scholarship is yet unclear about the ultimate identity of this Buddha. Due to its iconographic features and accompanying figures, it is believed to represent both the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni, and the universal Buddha, Vairochana. Buddhist divinities representing the middle level of sanctity surround this Buddha image. The ten disciples of the historical Buddha and relief figures representing different bodhisattvas. And as we just saw in the entryway are figures of protective deities representing the lowest level of sanctity. Before moving to exceptional Buddhist artworks from the Goryeo period, let me provide some context to the construction of Sakuram. A man named Kim Dae Song commissioned this artificial cave. Kim was a member of the Shilla royal family and prime minister at the time he commissioned this cave along with nearby Bulguksa or Buddha land temple. Kim had Sakuram built for a multitude of reasons, but it seems that the key motivation for Kim to have Sakuram and Bulguksa built was filial piety. He commissioned Bulguksa to pray for the well-being of his parents in his present life and Sokkuram to pray for the well-being of his parents in a previous life. But Sokkuram also fulfilled another function. In pre-modern East Asia, Buddhist temples, sculptures, woodblock prints and paintings were frequently commissioned for political reasons since Buddhism was also a powerful factor in the legitimacy of rule. In that sense, we can understand the majestic Buddha of Sokuram not only as an icon for worship,
but also as a visual statement of a royal science political power. Sokuram and Bulguksa bolstered the legitimacy of Kim Dae Song's position as prime minister. The close connection between Buddhist art and politics is something that we frequently encounter in East Asian Buddhist art, and Sokuram is a great example for that. Another excellent example for the religious and political functions of a Buddhist work is the Goryeo Buddhist Canon, also known as the Tripitaka Koreana. The original set of wood blocks was carved in the 11th century and contains hundreds of Buddhist scriptures, commentaries on the scriptures, monk biographies, travel diaries of monks who went from China to in India, um, Chinese Sanskrit dictionaries, etc. etc. These texts were first carved when the Khitan invaded Goryeo. But this version of the canon was destroyed by the Mongols when they invaded the Korean peninsula. So the Goryeo Koreans created a second set, which consists of more than 80,000 individual wood blocks, such as the one you can see in this photograph. Due to the superb wood carving skills of the Goryeo artisans, it took only 15 years to complete the carving of these 80,000 wood blocks. This second set is now stored at Heinza and prints are still made from these more than 800 year old wood blocks even today. What were the reasons for carving the entire canon of Buddhist writings? And why did the Koreans do this twice? First, people in pre-modern times believed that Buddhist texts have magical powers. Buddhas are enlightened beings endowed with magical powers, and the words of the Buddhas written down in the canon are similarly powerful. So imagine an entire set with thousands of pages of Buddhist literature functioning like a talisman which Goryeo Koreans believed had the magic powers to protect the peninsula from invaders such as the Khitan or the Mongols. Secondly, the Goryeo Buddhist canon also fulfilled a political function. In 10th to 13th century East Asia, we see the political rivalry between three powers, Song China, the Khitan or Liao, north of Song China, and Goryeo Korea. Song China had created the so-called Kaibao Buddhist canon in 983. The Khitan had carved their own version of the canon in the mid-11th century. The Goryeo Koreans, who had close cultural ties with the Liao and the Song, had to catch up. And so they created their own version of the Buddhist canon as symbolic or cultural capital. The physical presence of the Buddhist canon in Goryeo was a marker of Goryeo's political power and legitimacy. This was particularly important for King Hyunjong, who commissioned the first set of the canon. Hyunjong was the offspring of an illicit affair between a prince and a widowed queen. And so he tried throughout his life to legitimize his rule through various measures. And in this context, Hyunjong is believed to have commissioned the production of the first Goryeo canon. Another takeaway point about the Goryeo Buddhist canon is that the term Tripitaka Koreana is a misnomer. We really need to be cautious about terminology. Tripitaka refers to the three divisions of the oldest extant Buddhist canon, the Pali canon, which consists of the Vinaya, or rules of monastic discipline, the sutras, or the teachings of the Buddha, and the Abhidharma, the philosophical interpretations of Buddhist doctrine. The Pali Canon, however, was created around the first century BCE. The Goryeo Buddhist Canon is much larger than the Pali Canon. It contains more than 1400 volumes of text. Remember, the Buddhist Canon grew over time. And in this respect, it is different from the Bible, which was static, meaning that no additional texts were added to the Bible once the Christian clerics had determined 
which texts would go into the Old Testament and the New Testament. While there were no apocryphal scriptures added to the Bible, in the Buddhist canon we find a large number of these texts. Many of them were written in Central Asia, China and even Korea. Another important feature about the Gaudiya Buddhist canon is that the woodblocks of the canon played a major role in modern editions of the Buddhist canon. Buddhist study scholars today owe a great debt to the past efforts of these Gaudiya Koreans because the Buddhist literature that scholars of Chinese, Korean and Japanese Buddhism today use for their research, whether they are looking at the texts online or as a print version, they are looking at texts from the original Gaudiya Buddhist canon. We are now moving to the third and last part of this lecture, in which I will discuss some late Gaudiya period Buddhist paintings. On this slide, you see a painting of an Amitabha triad. Now, what's a triad? A triad is composed of a centrally placed Buddha accompanied by two Bodhisattvas. In this case, it's Amitabha, the Buddha of infinite light, who resides in the so-called Western Pure Land or Sukhavati, which in pre-modern Korea, Buddhist believers hope to be reborn into. And do you recognize the different levels of sanctity in this picture? Which figure do you think represents a higher level of sanctity? Right. The center of the triad is Amitabha Buddha, depicted in the upper half of the painting. So he represents a higher level of sanctity. While the two figures at the bottom of the painting, the Bodhisattvas Avalokiteshvara on the right and Master Mahaprabhu on the left, represent a lower level of sanctity. What do you notice about the artist's hierarchization of the Buddhist figures in this painting? The composition features Amitabha in the center, accompanied by eight Bodhisattvas depicted at a lower, slightly lower level than the Buddha, four to his right and four to his left. Do you notice how the size of the Buddha figure is much larger than the figures accompanying him? Art historians refer to this differentiation in size as hieratic scale, meaning that the size of a figure depends on its relative importance within the artwork. In addition to the composition of a painting, art historians typically examine iconography and style. So let me briefly explain one of the most salient features of late Gaudiya painting, and that is chromatic brilliance. In the following slides, I will show some details of the exquisite paintings we just looked at. Notice the little shading or mixing of colors. The painters mostly used red, green and blue. And this is a hallmark of Gaudiya Buddha's painting because the artists did not want to decrease the luminosity of the precious mineral pigments they were using. And so they did not mix the colors because that would lead to um, a decreasing quality of the intensity and brightness of the colors. Secondly, Gaudiya Buddha's painters lavishly used gold powder for the outlines and intricate patterns, which give the paintings a dazzling, iridescent appearance. The Korean artists use gold powder, which they mix with glue, in contrast to the Japanese who applied gold sheet in leaves for their Buddhist paintings. And thirdly, Gaudiya Buddha's paintings stand out for their lavish patterns on the depicted robes, crowns and veils, which stand in contrast to the visual simplicity of the colors. You can see such refined patterns in this detail that depicts the robes of Bodhisattva figures. Also note the graceful facial features of the Bodhisattva Master Mahaprabhta on the upper right. We know that this is the identity of this Bodhisattva because he has this iconographic feature of a little flask in his crown. That's why we know it's Master Mahaprabhta. A transparent veil made from finely meshed gauze elegantly frames this Bodhisattva's face. And on the lower left hand side of this photograph you can see 
how the late Goryeo Buddhist painters adorned the robes of the Bodhisattvas with sumptuously elegant patterns in gold. And in this photograph, you can see a detail of an arabesque medallion. Such medallions filled with flower patterns and scroll designs are a significant feature of Goryeo Buddha's painting. This detail also highlights the intensity and brightness of the gold pigment that the Goryeo Buddhist painters used. These Amitabha paintings we just examined seem to suggest that in late Goryeo Korea, virtually every Buddhist devotee prayed to Amitabha in order to gain rebirth in Amitabha's pure land subcavity. The early 14th century story about a man named Huang Nang provides further evidence for the ways in which Goryeo Koreans use paintings depicting Amitabha. According to this story, Wang Nang had died, but he appeared in his wife's dream and instructed his wife to hang a painting of Amitabha on the western wall of their house and contemplate the image. And according to the story, Wang Nang's wife followed her husband's instructions and in doing so, she was able to escape being taken to the Buddhist underworld and lived a very long life. Amitabha paintings were also commissioned for political reasons. This painting, for example, was commissioned by a man named Kon Bok Su in 1306. That was the time when Goryeo was occupied by the Mongols. According to an inscription on this painting, Guan prayed for the safe return of Kings Chungnyol and Chungson and Chungson's queen from Dadu, the, the UN capital, back to Goryeo. Before closing this lecture, let me briefly explain a specific feature which students often ask me about. Perhaps you already noticed this feature while we were looking at the Amitabha paintings, the swastika symbol. Swastika is a Sanskrit term that means well-being or auspiciousness. So traditionally, the swastika symbol is a mark of good fortune. The swastika is frequently depicted on the chest of Buddha images in East Asian Buddhist art. It was also used in pre-modern East Asia in various decorative arts, such as ceramics, lacquerware, or cloisonné. Summarizing this lecture, you learned about three major Buddhist achievements from Korea. The stone architecture and sculptures of Sakuram from Unified Chilla. The wood blocks of the Goryeo Buddhist canon that was carved twice. And Goryeo Buddhist paintings. You also learned some art historical terminology that will hopefully be useful for you next time you look at a Buddhist artwork. You learned that Buddhist art consists of a pantheon with numerous divinities of different hierarchical rank. You also learned that within the Buddhist pantheon, there are varying levels of sanctity depending on spiritual progress. So there are Buddhas, usually placed at a higher level of sanctity, than other figures such as bodhisattvas or protective deities. Another term we learned today is hieratic scale, which is related to the size of the figures in an architectural setting or in a painting, which signifies the relative importance of these figures within the artwork. Lastly, you learned about the chromatic brilliance of Goryeo Buddhist paintings and the meaning of the swastika symbol in Buddhist art. And remember, in pre-modern times, Buddhist art was not simply used as a decorative item, but rather served as a religious item of worship. It was an icon of worship. And a Buddhist artwork could also have various political functions. This is the end of the first part of this lecture. Thank you for watching.